Hello and welcome to OCD Game Changers, our bi-monthly, is it bi-monthly or bi-weekly? Like every two weeks is bi-monthly. Yeah, bi-monthly. <laughs> our bi-monthly um, Fireside Fridays. Yay! So my name is Chrissy Hodges. I'm the executive director and founder of OCD Game Changers. I'm the author of Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, and also the founder of Treatment for OCD Consulting and OCD Peers, which is a group-based practice that we just started, woohoo, ocdpeers.com. We can serve people all around the world to give support. Um, hey, Dave, thank you for being here. There's the OCD crusher, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so today, um, we are really excited to have Jessica Serber on. Yay, thank you for Hi. joining us. We have such Thanks a good topic me. today. So I'm gonna get her to um, tell everybody who you are. Hi, um, so I'm Jessica. I'm a LMFT, Licensed in Marriage Family Therapist in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm, I specialize in treating anxiety and OCD, um, other obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. So I treat health anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, body dysmorphia, panic disorder, um, sort of anything on the obsessive compulsive spectrum, but I'm really, really passionate about OCD. And so I'm happy to be here and doing this. Um, and yeah, I have a private practice in Los Angeles called Mindful CBT California, um, where I can work with people all around California and doing all teletherapy, so all online sessions right now. And then I have a professional Instagram account as well, at your mind is a muscle, that um, you can check out and I post some tidbits and information there. Excellent, I just bannered you. So there's, go to her Instagram account and give her a like. Um, oops. Oh, I meant to keep that up there. And hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Hello. Hello. Um, lots of people. So glad that you're here. This is such a good topic. So I, I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, first and foremost, just a little bit of information. OCD Game Changers is going to be rolling out some really, 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 really cool stuff in the next couple weeks. Um, we are we have a group of young adults that are going to be doing weekly TikToks. Thank goodness they're doing them and I don't have to do them. <laughs> and they, one week we're going to do topics on the different types uh, or the different themes of OCD, different comorbidity, comorbidities that not a lot of people talk about. And then the next week we're going to do TikToks on a stay in the life. These are going to be so cool. There's so many creative people working on this. We're still coming up with our name uh, for our group of young adults. Um, and uh, but that should be rolling out next week. I cannot wait. They're going to be. Guess what? It's going to be called TikTok Tuesdays. I love that. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. And then OCD Game Changers in the next week or so is going to be throwing out invitations for therapists um, to become involved in focus groups to help solve some of the biggest issues in our OCD community, financial, cultural barriers to treatment, educating people on how to treat OCD correctly, educating people on OCD awareness. We got a jump start in Austin a year and a half ago, and we're taking all that information and continuing, and I cannot wait for to see what to come. So if you're interested, go to OCD Game Changer or email me at OCD Game Changers at Gmail, but look for it on our social media so you can get involved and sign up. It's going to, you will be part of game changing solutions in our community. So now without further ado, let's get to the topic of the day. Um, I throw this out to people when I am, um, when talking to people about bringing them on fireside chats and it is what is a topic that you are passionate about? And I'm so excited that Jessica brought this up. OCD and grief. This is such an underserved topic that impacts so many people who live with OCD during the entire process of recovery and especially after treatment. So I'm um, really excited. We've got so much that we're going to talk about today. We welcome your comments and questions. Um, and Jessica, I'm just going to kick it off to you. What is it about this topic that was really important to you and why you feel like we need to bring some attention to it? Yeah, well, like you said, you know, I just don't think it's talked about enough. And I think we focus, I mean, and rightly so, we focus so much on treating the OCD that sometimes we forget about the rest of the person's life that's happening around it. And I just think it's really important for all of that to be honored and to have a place to get processed. Um, and, you know, especially because OCD is so hard to live with, 
plus the treatment ERP is a really challenging therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are a lot of other feelings that come up even just outside of the OCD, but that are related to OCD. And I think grief is one of those experiences and learning how to really live with this disorder and live with doing this treatment. Um, and so I think it's, I, you know, I'm just really passionate about making sure that everybody has a space to talk about everything that's going on, not just the OCD specifically. Um, and so, you know, I think sometimes if we don't talk about some of the sadness that shows up um, or some of the guilt or, you know, the denial or whatever it is that shows up in the grief process, then we're kind of missing a big chunk of what's happening for that person. Yes. Thank you so much for saying that because I feel and I, I feel like as someone with lived experience and I just woken up to this in the last couple of years about the grief that I experienced after OCD and continue to experience actually. And it just wasn't addressed. This wasn't because my therapist um, this wasn't because my therapist was bad. Like Dr. Phillips was awesome. Mm -hmm. But like you said, we focus so much on we need to stop this suffering. We've got to stop like the behaviors that are making you suffer. Mm -hmm. And I always say there's such a shortage of OCD therapists. It is hard for people to say, OK, well, after the behavioral therapy, let's continue for another six months to work on this when you might have a wait list that's three months long. And I know that therapists don't that doesn't mean therapists don't care, but it's it's also this. We've got to treat people. <laughs> We've got to get them out of suffering. And, and then and then and and we just need more therapists. That's there's a solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And that, that is that is the solution that we need for sure. Um, but I think, too, you know, definitely like processing the grief after treatment. But I also think that sometimes processing some of the grief of even just being diagnosed um, is really important because, you um, you know, I think as OCD specialists, we can be really eager to kind of like jump into the treatment. Like there's there's this treatment, ERP, it works. We really want to do it for you. We want you to stop suffering and we can be really eager. And sometimes we might miss what's blocking that person from actually being able to start on ERP. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes I think even just being diagnosed with OCD, there can be a grieving process there and sort of a coming to terms with it process that's really important. And, you know, the therapist might be ready to start on ERP, but if the person suffering with OCD isn't ready and hasn't gotten there and isn't on board, that's not gonna work. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like to help someone move through the grief um, of learning that they have a major mental illness and that basically, even if it was, even if before, wasn't ideal. It's almost like I have to leave this old self behind for this new self that I'm going to learn in treatment. You know, how do you walk someone through that without getting all therapeutic? But, you know, what's the process of that to, to grieve that and to be able to get started and be motivated to be kind of this new person with a diagnosis? Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the most important thing is letting that person know that their feelings are valid. Um, you know, I think just having a space to be able to let it out to someone else and really process what it's like to hear that you have a diagnosis. And, you know, of course, with OCD, you're dealing with so much anxiety, even leading up to the diagnosis, but then to hear about it and be told that you're going to, you know, start doing a treatment process that involves facing your fears and getting rid of your compulsions, which are the one thing that have made you sort of feel safe the whole time. Um, you know, it's really scary and there's a lot of anxiety in that. So, you know, I think just being able to really have a space to kind of honor those feelings just on the most basic level is really important. But I also think that this is where like e education around OCD can be really helpful. So, you know, I always really try to prioritize giving a lot of psychoeducation about what OCD is, how the anxiety cycle works why we do ERP, because it can seem like such a counterintuitive treatment when you're just getting started. Um, and I think, you know, I think really starting to learn about what OCD is and understand what it is and understand that you can learn to outsmart it too, mm -hmm. um, and kind of give some of that hope really can help to work through some of that initial grief that shows up. Uh, I really appreciate something that you just said, and that was, um, 
just facing the uncertainty and the anxiety about giving up the compulsions. Uh, and I want to segue that into kind of the next talking point. Um, I've never really thought about it that way. So I really appreciate that. It just like I had a little light bulb moment. My eyes might have gone when you said that, actually. <laughs> um, um, but I, I always think about OCD and especially in my experience before I was diagnosed and treated is I was surviving for 12 years. I was just straight up surviving the best way I can. Yeah. And that was, I was just clinging to these compulsions, you know, and the rope is like, like slowly fraying as the compulsions are stop, stopping to work. But the fear, um, the fear of letting go of those is terrifying. So with that said, um, there's also grief in giving up, giving up that, I guess the act of living with OCD, I don't, I don't think I'm saying that right, but people experience grief and kind of letting OCD go and moving into a new space of I'm healthier and I now have these tools. Um, someone the other day, I can't remember who it is. And so I, I don't want to like not give them credit, but someone described it as Stockholm syndrome. Mm. And I just so much, Oh, I was one with Patrick McGrath. And he said one of his clients described it as that of like Stockholm syndrome of the, I have to let go of this thing that was even torturing. Yeah. And you know, do you have any thoughts about that? That just the grieving process of letting OCD go. Yeah. I mean, I think that can show up in a lot of different ways, you know, for different people, depending on what your experience is. Um, but, you know, I always say that OCD brings all of the fear, but it also kind of gives you this like security blanket on a silver platter. And it says, we fear all of this, but here, if you do these compulsions, you can feel better. Mm -hmm. And even though we know that the compulsions don't lead to feeling better, I mean, maybe in the short term, sort of at the beginning, there can be some temporary relief, but we know it causes far more long-term suffering, but there's still that hope that maybe the compulsion will work this time, you know, or if I just check enough, or if I just check in the right way, or I talk to the right person, or I read the right article for the 10th time or whatever it is, there's this hope that maybe I can, maybe I can solve it. Um, you know, maybe I can find a solution for it and I don't have to deal with this anymore, or I don't have to do ERP because that sounds really hard. Um, so, you know, I definitely think there's a process of sort of giving up the security blanket and kind of jumping into the deep end a little bit when we start ERP. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, you know, I think that hope of solving it that comes with compulsions is really something that is grieved. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like you think you're going to get to the promised land and that there's hope to just like not have to deal with it anymore and not have to learn how to live with the thoughts. And so there is a big grief around that, but also just, sometimes compulsions are something to do, right? And, um, you know, obviously there is so much more for people to do in their lives besides be a slave to the OCD. But depending on how long you've been living with it, compulsions and OCD may be one of the bigger parts of your life. Mm -hmm. And giving up compulsions and all the time that was spent on those now means there's a lot of free time that's opened yes. up. Yes. And that's really where people get their lives back and is the most valuable part of a lot of this, I think, is being able to find what you actually want to be filling that time with. But at the beginning, until that happens, you're sort of grieving having something to do, you know, something that keeps you busy. And now I don't have a lot of friends, maybe, because I've been stuck at home with my OCD or I don't have a job because I wasn't able to work. And doing compulsions can kind of feel productive in the moment. And so, you know, all that time opening up is really the blessing of treatment. But at the beginning, I think is something that can be really overwhelming. Thank you for bringing that up. What a great point. I, I hear that a lot of the, uh, I, I hear that a lot from clients. I didn't necessarily in my own life experience it, but I can, I can definitely relate, but it's the, well, I guess I could like, who am I now without it? Not that OCD goes away. Right, right. But who am I now when the majority of my my life was taken up by compulsions? Right, right. Like, what do I do with this time? And, you know, that 
I think, you know, again, depending on how long you're kind of in the thick of it, it can really feel like it's your identity and really define your life. So another thing I think that the, this brings up for me, especially, and um, I was diagnosed and treated pretty early in life, you know, 2021, 20, I can't remember the age, but um, I feel really lucky that I was able to find the right treatment, even back in the AOL, doc, you know, dial up days. <laughs> but um, I do remember, even though this is, okay, so this is interesting. Even though I um, was able to kind of follow the normal, normal like proceeding things that you do in life like i graduated from high school and then i went to college i was really active in college and i had a psychotic break <laughs> basically you know like or whatever and then i got treated or in all this um i all i even with that i wasn't behind my peers hmm. but i felt behind in life you know i felt this this horrible emptiness of all of my uh, Okay, the better way of putting it is I don't even know who I am. I've literally for 12 years just been, like you said, like a slave to this. And so I didn't even know who I was. And I was extremely jealous of everybody around me. I was, and even though we were at the same kind of level, I still had the same opportunities. If I wanted to go to grad school, I could. And I, I chose to become a flight attendant out of the random blue. Wow. <laughs> I did. I was only, I only did it for nine months because it was so horrible. But, um, <laughs> that was like, a really hard job. I, I could never be a flight attendant. So it's so I'm awful. Not. No offense to flight attendants out there. I, I hated it. And then I hated all human beings after that job. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the opportunities weren't not there for me, but it didn't matter. Like mentally, I felt behind and that was grief worthy. And I didn't understand that until later, like in my thirties of just the grief that I was not facing of feeling behind everybody else, feeling stupid, feeling broken. I think what you were saying earlier about never coping with the fact that this is a major mental illness. And I didn't even deal with the grief of having a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we can, sometimes when you come out of the fog of the OCD, right? And you're sort of feeling it start to lift and you're finding that freedom. Um, I think you, I see it a lot, people sort of looking back and going, what, what was that time? You know, what was I doing then? Or like, as, as you've put it, like, who am I now? Mm -hmm. You know, that it just feels like there's such a stark contrast and it's almost hard to, not that, not that, someone ever forgets what it was like to be suffering with OCD, but you sort of can't imagine like, how was I living like that all the time? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I do think that really shows up for a lot of people. I, th I absolutely feel that way. Sometimes I think back on, you know, and I talk a lot about my story and sometimes I even tell the story, especially at the time I was at the lowest in a suicide attempt. And I just think, how did I even survive that? Now, I know I was a lot younger then and had a lot more energy to survive it. But mm -hmm. it's I think that also feeds into, for me, the black and white thinking um, of when I'm in OCD, I never feel like it's going to be better. And when yeah. I'm out of it, I never think it's going to get as bad as it was. Right. And, and even recognizing that sometimes helps me to push into the uncertainty, which right. sucks. <laughs> Right, right, absolutely. Or, or even, you know, a lot of people when they sort of do treatment on their main theme or themes and are feeling some relief, a lot of times it switches to that sort of fear of anxiety itself or the fear of OCD, Gosh. quote unquote, coming back. You know, I always say it never went away, but people talk about it that way, right? Like, what if it comes back or what if it gets really bad again? Mm -hmm. uh, so even, you know, even when you're in that state where you're living sort of with some more freedom from OCD, it's still there, you know, and mm -hmm. it's still causing anxiety or still sort of feels like it's posing a threat. Mm -hmm. um, but I really do think that once you've been through the proper treatment for it and you have the tools and you know what to do during a spike, we can never say never, you know, but I don't think most people don't go back to how they were ever pre-treatment. You know, once you have those tools, even if you do enter a big OCD spike again, or there's some life change that happens that triggers it, you're always going to be in a different place once you have those tools in your back pocket. 
Yeah, I always like to say that the tools that we learn in therapy are like little building rock blocks we put over rock bottom. Yeah. And we may slide down, but we're going to slide down on the building rock blocks. And it's, right. it, it's like our responsibility to remember that we're actually, even we, if we feel the heat of rock bottom, like we're actually safe. We just have to remember that those tools work. That's a really great way to put it. Yeah, it's sort of like your foundation has lifted, you know, like <laughs> there's some scaffolding. So you're never going to kind of get back to ground yeah. zero. Yeah, I should draw a cartoon of that. Yeah, you should. I mean, not funny, but, you know, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it would be kind of a cool visual. Next yeah, to my yeah. banana. And I think <laughs> yeah, it would fit in right next to the banana. <laughs> Um, but no, I think, you know, I think that does sort of speak to kind of the hope of treatment too, you know, and that's, that is part of grieving is getting to that point where you can sort of accept what it is that's happening and also then be able to accept that there's hope, Mm -hmm. you know, there is, there is freedom from this, not that it's ever completely gone. Um, but you know, that you, that you do have that hope of there's a treatment that works and that you can sort of get the tools in therapy and maintain even on your own outside of therapy, you know, afterwards. So I think that that, that speaks a lot to the hope that there is for, for the disorder. Yeah. So that, that brings up something for me that you said earlier actually brings, so, you know, you can experience grief, um, at the diagnosis, you know, and, and then, you know, talking through and giving some psychoeducation and helping to understand the process of it and that there is hope. Mm. Um, but there's also a time and, and this is where I see a lot of kind of almost the grief starting for people, whether it be in groups or working one on one doing peer support. Um, it's almost this grief of um, and the way that I can relate to it was the you know, I suffered for so long and it was literally like being in battle every single day. And then when I was in treatment, it, there was a day where there was a four hour span that I wasn't thinking about sexual orientation OCD. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then of course, when I thought about that, I wasn't thinking about it, then I thought about it again. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, it's back. Yeah. But <laughs> I remember that moment and going like almost giddy, like, Oh my God, I think treatment works. I think this works. And then that was really squashed with this overwhelming, I didn't let it in because I didn't know how to process grief until like 10 years later. But there was this overwhelming sense of grief of, Oh my God, is that, is that it? Mm. Like, is, is that all? I have a couple thoughts. Like, is that all this is? Like I just have to change my behavior. And then all of a sudden, like we were saying, I went and reviewed all the shit that I had missed in my life, all the milestones that were ruined. Um, but, but even scarier to me, it was, you know, well, Dr. Philipson says this doesn't go away. Right. So is this going to happen again? Is this my life? And then kind of grieving the idea, um, which is different from at the beginning of or right at a diagnosis of that, final realization and acceptance of, oh my God, this is who I am the rest of my life and the damaged goods that come along with that. That to me was one of the biggest source of grief. Now, I don't think I'm damaged goods now. (laughs) (laughs) That's so bad self-talk, but I hear that so much from people. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's also, um, a very untapped, you know, or it's it's just this invasion, I think, that you get upon the realization before, like, oh, like, you know, like radical acceptance or whatever, that all of a sudden there's this, it opens up this door and all this horrible stuff comes in about what it must be like or what it's going to be like living a life with a mental illness. Yeah, yeah. So I think you're bringing up another kind of general topic or like area where the grief shows up, which is around our expectations, you know, no one grows up or at any point in their life sort of has the expectation of having a mental illness or of going through something that is this challenging. Um, And so I, I absolutely think that you're right there. You know, it can be just an expectation. Oh, I'm hearing an echo. Okay. Is it better? Did you hear that? I could hear like feedback for a second. You sound great. Okay. Um, um, 
you know, just the expectations of what I thought life was going to be like. Yes. Right? And yeah. that I never accounted for this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, of course, this is different at various points, right? Like, there's the time when you're actually like really in the throes of the OCD, maybe don't even know what it is yet, haven't gotten treatment yet. And then there's the point, you know, there's a whole spectrum, but then we, we get up to the point where life is so much better, OCD isn't in control anymore, but it's still there, right? And so just that idea of like, I never expected to live with this, or I never asked to live with this. Um, and then even, you know, the expectation of hearing, like Dr. Phillipson said to you that, you know, there's no cure for this, right? But it's a very treatable thing. Mm -hmm. It's very treatable and there's so much hope for recovery and it can get so much better. And, you know, OCD might still be there, but it doesn't bother you in the same way or it doesn't get to you in the same way. But just that whole idea of, you know, this is something that I'm going to be living with now. It's going to be a factor in my life. Um, but it's not, it, it hopefully won't be the biggest factor. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, I think, I think that's really, really important too, is realizing like, it'll, it might be there, but, um, but it doesn't have to be everything. And so mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of grief yeah. around accepting that it's there. Um, but I think you're also when you brought up radical acceptance, you know, it brought me back to thinking like acceptance sort of is it's one of the stages of grief. It's sort of the last stage of grief. Um, it's not the goal or it's not the end game, but you know, that is, that is a stage that we get to and we hope to get to. And sometimes we might come in and out of, yes. right. But there's so much freedom in, in, in accepting OCD and in accepting the diagnosis and in accepting reality um, that when that happens, it's like the whole game changes really. You know, mm -hmm. and um, so I do think that that's really important to remember that, that getting to acceptance is a process, which is why we need to be processing grief in therapy or on our own, you know, through journaling and things like that, um, because that's how you get to that acceptance place where that's really where the work can be done and the freedom can be found. Yes. This brings up for me in, in even just talking about grief and getting to radical acceptance. It. It, it brings up so many thoughts. So I'm going to try to contain them. So I just don't mm -hmm. burst wide open in a 20 minute diatribe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's two things. Number one, I remember talking with someone one time who did not have OCD, but she was talking about having um, a physical ailment and she had lost a, a part of her body, like a limb. Mm -hmm. And um, she was talking about the grieving of losing the limb even though she functions normally, like was able to adapt and do pretty much most of the things that that she did before she lost it. And I remember opening my eyes to that and going, but she still had to grieve the loss of that expectation and kind of the whole part that she thought she was. It doesn't change who she is, but to her, she had to grieve that. And I remember being able to relate that to my OCD story and my experience of going, um, you know, kind of along the lines that you were saying, nothing changed about me. I mean, yeah, I changed because of OCD, but nothing like can touch my inner core and values, but you feel like it does and you feel broken and you feel damaged. Um, and, and I just wanted to bring that up as, as just a comparison, even when people have physical ailments, even mm -hmm. when physical people have physical, you know, like this, this woman did in, in losing a limb, she still had to grieve it. It, but still go on and then accept who she was without mm -hmm. that part of her. Um, and, and I thought, I thought that was really special to hear and, and really normalizing considering that's a lot less stigmatized than mental illness in general. Um, and then I had another point and that just went out the window and I can't remember it, but it will, it'll come back to me. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully it comes back. So no, that, that is, I mean, that's such a good, that is such a good comparison. Um, you know, really having to, and, and I think it's so different to be in the accept, acceptance stage of grief and look back um, than it is to be going through the grieving process. 
right? Yes. So that's why I think it, it is so important for us to not, you know, jump ahead too much, you know, sometimes with starting therapy um, or just at any point in the therapy, you know, if those feelings are coming up, because we have to really like the way she got to acceptance was through grieving. It was through going, oh, this horrible thing happened to me. And if I just accept it, I'll be better. So now I'm in acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that whole period where it feels really dark and really ugly. And there's not a lot of hope. And there's a lot of sadness or anger. Um, you know, and I think those those feelings have to be honored. You mm -hmm. know, I'm big, I work on this myself a lot, but I'm a big proponent of like emotions have to be felt. That's the only way that they're going to move through us and get to, you know, that the only way that we can kind of get to that point of healing. Um, and so, you know, expecting someone to live with OCD, grieve the diagnosis and the process of having to start therapy and do ERP at the same time is a really tall order. So I think sometimes, you know, breaking that down and slowing down, obviously we want to get to the ERP because we know that is where people suffering will be reduced. But I also think that sometimes we have to remember that, you know, we have to slow down a little bit and take it step by step. No, I, I agree with that. I love that. Um, and something to say to that. I'm sorry, I'm just losing my train of thought here. Um, it's Friday but, afternoon. <laughs> I know, right? I did, I did write some stuff down, but um, no, I, I, I agree with that. And, and kind of to come back to that is, you know, you were talking about getting to self acceptance and being able to reflect. And the kind of the visual that I thought about was when you said that was like when people say that grief comes in waves, mm. and and I think that we forget that that yes, you can grieve the loss of something, but in in a lot of ways we do lose we kind of i'm just gonna say this but you, you can disagree or you can think i'm nuts or whatever but like i feel like we also kind of lose our expectations and innocence when ocd you know just kind of that wide-eyed optimism about oh my gosh life is all ahead of me and i hear a lot of people and for myself it was the same thing of like life could have been great if ocd didn't you know hit me square in the face and derail me for 10 years um, I, I certainly feel different about that now. Um, mm -hmm. but back then before grieving and before treatment and all that, that's, that really is how I felt. And, um, when you, I, I think in keeping in with the weight theory, like there was a loss for you, you know, when you have OCD, there, there's a loss there mm -hmm. and the loss is what you thought life would be. And you mentioned that earlier and, um, the same way when you're grieving a loss of like a, a person or a pet or a relationship, you know, you may work through some grief and then something hits you a year later and boom, you're like down in the waves again, you know, and feel like you're grasping for air. Um, and it's okay to pull out of that radical acceptance and revisit times where it was tough or you may relapse and you may think, oh my gosh, like why me? Or I feel jealous of everybody or I feel this. And that I think for me is just the natural progression of how grief works. Right. Like, there really isn't an end for me. It's just continuing to work through it. Like you said, you know, just working through the emotion in order to just honor them more than anything versus squash them. Oh, yeah. I remember what I was going to say really quick. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Uh, you were saying, um, about how these are heavy emotions at the same time we're, we're doing ERP and you know, that's a tall order for mm -hmm. us to, to do therapy and grieve at the same time. And I also just wanted to add, um, I don't know if this applies to everybody with OCD, but grief and sadness and these heavy emotions are really hard. I think for people with OCD, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've experienced that in myself and also in talking to people with OCD, um, that it's just hard to almost submit or like not submit, I guess. Yeah. Submission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To submit to big, heavy emotions because of the fear of not being able to come out of them or the yeah. fear of not being able to control them. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, good. <laughs> I good. see. Yeah. <laughs> no, that totally makes sense. And I see it a lot with people who, you know, 
were in a really dark place with their OCD at one point, you know, or maybe were suicidal or had to be hospitalized or something like that, that there is that real fear of what's going to happen if I feel something really strongly again. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, I always, I always say that, you know, even just feeling can be an exposure, right? And so that's something that we, we have to work on a lot, you know, is that feeling the feelings, they have to be felt if we're going to heal, but it, it can also be really scary um, to feel them and to take that risk, right? To take the risk of feeling those feelings, but this time maybe feeling it with some new tools or feeling it with support from a therapist that you trust, um, who, you know, you know is there and is sort of watching to make sure that you don't go back to that really dark place too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I definitely think that's a part of it. And one thing that I wanted to bring up about your point about the loss of innocence, yeah. um, you know, that is something that I really think about a lot when I'm working with people who are younger, especially, um, you know, people in like middle school maybe or high school or sometimes even younger, but you know, definitely with like my middle school or high school age clients that, you know, OCD just came and sort of hit them out of nowhere. And, um, you know, if life was just sort of going pretty well before that, there can be that kind of loss of innocence at a young age that, you know, they have to learn those lessons early that we all have our thing and, you know, in life and this is my thing or that, you know, life isn't perfect, that sometimes we go through hard periods and we have to work to overcome them. Mm -hmm. And I think in the long run, those people end up doing so well in life and learn lessons that a lot of us don't get to learn until way later or don't have to learn until way later. But at that point in their lives, I mean, that's a really powerful and just overwhelming thing to come to terms with at such a young age. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And um, I want to comment on that before we get to kind of final thoughts uh, to okay. wrap up. It's, it's already the end. Like this went by so fast and there's so much. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> you can um, one of the things I, I appreciate you bringing up that point, because one of the things that I tell people, especially when they're younger, I work with a lot of people doing support, not therapy, but just peer support and younger age. And, you know, when, when people have these feelings of grief, of I'm behind everybody, you know, life isn't what it, it should have been, or I, you know, I lost all this time. I really gently remind people in an effort to empower them that you, because of what you've gone through, you are ahead of the game. Yes, you don't yes. know you are. <laughs> and you're probably not going to know it until you're in your 30s. <laughs> Right. But like, hang on through the terrible 20s, <laughs> because lots of people just not not lots of people don't just skate by in the 20s. But a lot of people really don't feel just, you know, have life changing events, you know, until they have a loss or until they have kids and maybe something goes wrong or something. They have a health issue um, and we just become so much better equipped when and, and I think it's ironic that we spend so much time thinking we're behind everybody else yes. when in fact like and and then on top of it getting ERP therapy for God's sake like you learn the art of pushing into the uncertainty <laughs> this is literally something we have to do for our whole lives in every area of our lives I know I know we're ahead of the curve but you know people can Really, and I think that's that is such a benefit too of of just engaging in the grieving process, taking that step into it, um, not being afraid of the emotions. Um, I'm going to do shameless promotion on our peer groups on, on how that can help in a bit. Um, but but yeah, being able to get to a place and in that empowers self love and self compassion, and really being able to see um, the bad stuff in your life can really reap the benefits of of being very prepared for things in life. Oh my God, totally. And I think we really saw that with this whole COVID situation we're in. Right. You know, <laughs> I was like shocked at the beginning about just seeing the contrast and how people in my well, personal friends, yeah. friends like that were dealing with it versus how my clients were dealing with it. I was blown away and just yeah. really had that realization of, yeah, my clients have these tools. They know how to live with uncertainty. 
Um, they know how to face fear and still get done what needs to get done. Yeah. Um, and not to say that, you know, it's easy or it doesn't affect anybody, but I think we can really see what you're talking about. You, you really are well equipped sometimes. Yeah, I'm still saying it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so Jessica, this has been such a pleasure to, to just have your knowledge and your your passion just shines through when you're talking. It's so nice to connect with people who really just love our community and love the work that you're doing. Um, uh, you know, as someone who suffers with OCD, I just want to thank you and just really appreciate you. So, um, so thank, thank you for being here. Yeah, and thank you for everything you do for this community. Uh -huh. I mean, and you're just such a... I mean, you're such, you know, not to put pressure on you, but you're like such a role model for so many people in this community of what recovery looks like and how much you do, you know, just with OCD Game Changers and now OCD Peer and everything. It's it's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. And and please, I welcome your kind of final thoughts for people um, who are listening and who may be, you know, on the verge of entering the grief stage or maybe in the middle of it and, and just need some words of encouragement. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, really generally just know that there's hope. You know, I just always want people to remember that, that even when things are at their worst, there's hope. And especially when it comes to OCD, it's amazing that there's this treatment that we know works and, you know, can really get people results and get their lives back. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you are grieving and you're having a hard time kind of getting to that point of doing, doing treatment, um, let yourself have those feelings, but also do it in a way that's productive, you know, so be working on those feelings with your therapist or in a focused way yourself. Um, Shiva Rajai, I think is how you pronounce her last name. Um, she once said she was, we were talking and she said, um, you can grieve, but don't die at the grave site. Mm. And I really love that, you know, that grief has to happen, but then there also has to be a point where we sort of work on accepting the reality of what is and face what is it that I need to do now, right? Yeah. So you can grieve this diagnosis and we can go through that. And then also we don't want to, we don't want it to stop there. We want you to get to that next point of acceptance and treatment because that's where, you know, that's where the healing happens. That's great. Oh, I love that quote. I'm going to write it down. No, I love it so much. Yeah. And my final words on this topic are, um, you know, I was one of the ones that in a lot, and, and many people do this, I got out of treatment and I said, it's done. I want nothing to do with this. I'm going to run as far away from it as I can. Unfortunately, you can't run from us and It will always find you. Um, <laughs> and um, it wasn't until 13 years after uh, getting out of treatment when I was just so wrapped up and tied up and bound by self-hatred um, and stigma that a peer support specialist came to me when, and I, when I was meeting with them and they said, I'm going to give you permission to grieve. I'm going to give you permission to be sad and angry and resentful and whatever you need to do because you are stuck. And th what's keeping you stuck is your inability to feel those emotions. Yeah. And all I needed was someone to give me permission. And then I let let my guard down. I walk through the emotions and that's when my healing journey started. Shameless promotion, but I will say it. One of the best ways to do that is meeting other people that have been through OCD, been through your themes, been through treatment, not been through treatment, just live the experience of OCD. And that's one of the things we provide at OCD peers. Um, we provide themed groups and all topics OCD and it is magical, magical, magical to watch when people see other people around the world who know exactly what it's like to experience this and you can just feel the start of the healing begin. So please visit us at ocdpeers.com if you want to check out our groups. We do we are going to start doing community nights that are free for first timers Q&A. Um, we're also by the way Jessica going to do a OCD peers therapist free Q&A community night coming up soon. <laughs> because <laughs> we're going to be starting to run consultation groups. So it's going to be so cool. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, so I want to end by saying this. Thank you for being here. And wherever you are in your journey to OCD, I'm going to give you permission right now to feel. I'm going to give you permission to grieve. If you're stuck there, if you don't know how, just embrace it. But the quote is, 
don't grieve to the gravesite. We can grieve, but we can't die at the gravesite. There we go. So that's our that's our advice we're gonna leave you with today. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. And thank you, Jessica, for being here. This is so great. I appreciate you. you. And um, I'll look forward to seeing everybody on Monday at Monday Mavericks with Miss Lisa Coyne. And we're gonna talk about all the cool things that she's been doing and that she's going to be doing. Can't wait to have her and connect with her. And then make sure you look out for TikTok Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be looking out for it. <laughs> will not be seeing me on TikTok Tuesday ever. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend and we will see you on Monday. Bye. Bye.